Hello, welcome back to Movie Husbands. Today we'll be reviewing The Brutalist. The Brutalist is an epic historical drama written and directed by Brady Corbet. The film chronicles 30 years in the life of Laszlo Toth, a Hungarian-born Jewish architect who survives the Holocaust. The film stars Adrian Brody, Felicity Jones, Guy Pierce, and many more. So Matt, what do you think of The Brutalist? All right, so The Brutalist, I would say, is an extremely focused, disciplined, and narratively dense film mm -hmm. about many different things, but mainly I think it's about the immigrant experience with this central focus on brutalist architecture, a style known for showcasing bare building materials in a grand and almost imposing manner. The film feels both simple and sprawling all at the same time. We had the uh, privilege of seeing this at the New York Film Festival. There was a Q&A that followed it. And in that Q&A, director Brady Corbet and set designer Judy Becker discussed how brutalist architecture is rooted in this harmony of maximalism versus minimalism. But this dichotomy is not just a feature of the film. It's more so a guiding principle that follows the film in all of its facets. From the architecture itself, to the characters, to the themes, to the score, the film is constantly seesawing between the calm and the chaotic. And for me, I thought it was a roaring success. The film's production itself, I would say, is almost comically rooted in brutalism as well. Made with a very paltry $9 million, the film manages to feel like it was made with a budget maybe 10 times that amount. And with a massive runtime of about three and a half hours, the film somehow remains tight and focused as a character piece. Its ambition never really drifts far away from its central themes. It is, I think, without a doubt, probably one of the most massive achievements in cinema this year so far, and I really look forward to diving into this film more with you. As I left the theater, I texted a friend and I said something along the lines of, if you don't find this film impressive on some level, like I'd question what you're looking for in films. The Brutalist is so finely realized and so expansive, yet like controlled, so gorgeous in its photography, but like so personal in its writing that it's a film who whose ambitions can only be described as an American epic, as people keep talking about that it is. I don't think it hides both in its far-reaching uh, story or even as um, you were talking about with the runtime, that it is an American epic. However, if I describe this plot to you from beginning to end and some of the themes, like you were talking about the immigrant experience, there's something with art and commerce going on here. Some interesting tidbits on like the history of displaced persons um, assimilating to America. One of my favorite themes, the rotten core at the heart of the American dream. I love that stuff. All of that sounds like homework, right? But on a minute to minute basis, the film is so engaging and even propulsive for the most part. I would say the first half is a bit more so than the second half, but even so, it, it's a film that just absolutely breezes by. I could tell how you were feeling about the film because during the intermission, I was like, do you like it so far? And you said, oh yeah. Like you said <laughs> it with such a surety. It was so clear and obvious why it's a film that's worth appreciating. Yeah. I loved interpreting it in that moment, but yeah, it's going to be a fascinating film to talk about. But from the very first like instance that the film starts, we get this kind of upside down shot of Adrian Brody surrounded by darkness. Somebody is waking him up. The score is just like blaring in the background. I think at this point, it's only like clanking. It's very percussive. It's this repetitive clanking and this long handheld shot from the bottom of the ship of him gathering his things and anxiously making his way above as we see, we eventually see the Statue of Liberty. All of this is going on while we hear a letter from his wife that's essentially acting as narration and telling us what happened before the film. But from the moment that it started, I was absolutely locked in. Its initial scenes start with such a brave, ferocious intensity that I, I can't imagine how it would keep this pace for 3.5 hours, and it mostly does. The prologue is maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and then that sets up the story that's to come. But there's a strain and a desperation to the tone that's really extraordinary in these initial scenes and it's alleviated by the opening credits that hit with the main theme, it almost acts as like this relief for the audience with this triumphant yeah, yeah, score. Yeah. Our audience burst into applause. <laughs> the hype for The Brutalist has been pretty insane ever since it premiered at Venice, so people were very excited. But after like a, a very intense first 10 minutes and then you hear the theme and then you see The Brutalist, it's like, here we go. Yeah, you yeah. know, it was, it was really a lot of fun. When we were coming out of the movie, all the performances in the film were so strong that I asked you what your favorite performance was. And I like that neither one of us answered the question. We kind of just ended up talking about actors for like a half mm. hour. But that goes to show you there's really not a weak link in the bunch here. It's a terrific ensemble. Adrian Brody, I think, is like clearly trying to win an Oscar here. But his transformation from quiet immigrant who's down on his luck to somebody who's, who's a lot more intense in the mm. second half of the film. But many of his scenes have this great poignant quality to them that he's just, he's a revelation to watch. A wide-ranging mastery 
of the type of acting that he's doing throughout the film. A sleeper pick, I think, for a best performance in the film might be Felicity Jones. I don't know if she's like the best performance, but she has a scene towards the end that is just an absolute knockout. Oh, and, yeah. and in some ways, the, the film absolutely hinges on that moment. There's not a, a weak actor in the bunch here. Guy Pierce, certainly so. Yeah, I would say Guy Pierce was one of my favorite characters in the film. Yeah. I think he brings a lot of humor to the film. But also, I just want to point out and tie this back to what I was saying at the beginning. So many of these characters are rooted in this theme of brutalism. And I think Adrian Brody is a great example there because his character is both calm and collected and then absolutely off the rails at other times. Also, another underlying feature of the film is dealing with the Holocaust because it has affected him so deeply, yeah. obviously so. In a way, the film is also having a discussion about the trauma related to the Holocaust. This goes slightly in tandem with it being an immigrant story, but it's also more of an underdog story as well. Laszlo being Jewish, at, especially at the time that the film takes place, makes him an outsider in the U.S., even post-World War II. There's a notable scene where he's asked to make a chapel, and he objects to that because he wants a place for people of worship of all backgrounds, not just one background. Mm. But the public seems really uncomfortable with this, and he has to outline specifically that it's a Christian place of worship, not a place of worship for whoever you may be. So in the background, much more so than the foreground, I think there's, there's a slight theme of Christian supremacy going on here. Like, you have to adhere to Christian values, be a white Christian, and that makes people a lot more comfortable with the things that you're doing. I remember when James Joyce was writing Ulysses, the main character in that book is Leopold Bloom, and he said that Leopold Bloom had to be a Jew because it had to make sense that the entire town was undermining him at all times. At that time, in especially, I think, the Ulysses was written in the 1920s, they were a race that was very discriminated against and they were not taken seriously by the masses, certainly very unfairly so. But I think that's another reason that fits into his experience of being an underdog in this story is his Jewish background. And not only is this uh, immigrant story playing out, but I would say also the themes of class division are playing out. This couldn't be more apparent in his relationship to Guy Pierce's character, Harrison Lee Van Buren. And so his arrival in the film is during the surprise. Laszlo has been contracted to rebuild this library in this gigantic mansion. Mm -hmm. He is not supposed to be aware of it. He's supposed to come back as a surprise, but he comes home early. He finds them all still working there, and he is not happy. He is upset. He kicks them all out. He's upset.net. He is upset.net. His mother is sick. <laughs> his sick mother is woman. dying. Well, it's funny because he's talking about how his mother's in the car and sick, and there's a whole freaking mansion like i don't understand yeah. what he's complaining about they're like they're working on one room and we find out later there's a guest house yeah although there's actually there's no there's not a lot of furniture i don't think there's a lot of furniture, yeah, there's yeah. No furniture in the guest house but the accommodations <laughs> of that guest house and the state of the guest house i want to talk about we'll talk about a little okay. bit of set design in a little okay. bit but there there's a lot going on there playing with this class oh there's so much to talk about anyways so after kicking everybody out he comes to this realization that this dude is a master architect <laughs> he goes back to him he apologized ends up paying him which he refused to do before, yeah. funny enough, you get this idea that he's funny, he's endearing, he makes this apology. So you think that, you know, there's some redeeming qualities about him. That's when he recruits Laszlo to work on this massive community project that entails the church that you were discussing. Yeah. Within his character and his role, there are so many little things that you have to pick out in these scenes. The man is clearly privileged and racist. He makes remarks very early on in the film about hating beggars frequently. And in one of his first lines, he verbally assaults a black man for being on his property as if no black person oh, should ever be right. there. And it's through the process of this film that we come to learn that this man is not as endearing and nice as he seems. There's a lot more going on here about his wealth and his privilege. I think it's a a great example of white, male, uh, patriarchy, rich, complete picture of a person that's like that. <laughs> and I could I could list quite a few that mm. exist in the world today that are very rich and have way too much power. Take two guesses who we're voting for. That being said, Guy Pierce plays this role absolutely brilliantly, I think. His emotions are seesawing from these outbursts at the people around him to moments of personal reflection where you just almost feel like you might care about him. Of course, these moments are a little bit more of a ruse because they are centered on himself rather than the people around him, but it tells us so much about the world he grew up in and the life he lives. Towards the end of the first half, there is a visit with Laszlo and Harrison Van Buren where 
after dinner, they sit in these leather armchairs and they have this long one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's really good. It's one of my favorite scenes in the movie because there's just this palpable electricity between them. They're sharing with one another. They're emotionally open with one another, but they're also having really interesting intellectual conversation. They're just getting to know each other. And we also, at this point in the film, don't know much about his character. He seems like he's giving Laszlo, who we're all rooting for, a really great opportunity. So I think we're more on his side for this part of the film but he begins to tell one of those stories that you were in reference to about beggars. I think it's about his grandparents, and I won't spoil it here exactly what he says, but it's the first little nugget of something that you say, mm. there's something about him where his prosperity does have an ignorance, but it's an ignorance you can laugh at at first, and then you realize slowly that there's something a little more insidious going on as, as the film progresses. Not to mention that scene ends in one of my favorite reused lines of the film, which is when he says something along the lines that I find our conversations very intellectually stimulating yeah but it's delivered very dryly in a way that i think is made funnier by the fact that i think he really thinks that he's 50 percent of what makes this conversation yeah stimulating. instead of just a listener <laughs> yeah and i do want to get into that a little bit more because i think his character has so much more going on. i just don't want to spoil it so when we get into more conversation uh, okay. deeper conversation as we mentioned it's an immigrant story this film and even though its subject matter is uniquely american both in theme and its sensibility it reminds me a lot of victorian novels like something charles dickens would write think of like Oliver Twist, but it's about people who are down on their luck and usually part of the poorest class who come into contact with people who have a lot of disposable income and what the relationship between them is like and how their life changes. The film is very concerned with class. Laszlo is an artist in the film. He has a true artist sensibility and wealth is always secondary to that vision. However, the film is careful to show us that Laszlo is living on charity when the film starts and, and for a good portion of the film, actually. I think with Guy Pierce's character, it's very easy for him to say all of these things that he says about beggars because he doesn't realize the wealth that he has and how that's imposing on other people. It's made even more apparent by this building that he wants to build. He talks about it as like a community center <laughs> where everybody could gather and do things. There'd be activities and these things switch in his mind very quickly. There's going to be like a swimming pool and a court and then all these things start changing once the costs start coming into play. But of course, the most monumental part of this structure is the church, which you had described earlier. This whole idea of class plays a role immediately from the beginning, I think, in their living arrangements. Because yes, Laszlo is living on the property, but the little cottage house in which he's living in, you know, the walls are barren. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of chipped paint. There's not really nice furniture in there. It almost looks like a dump. Yeah. It's crazy considering just right up that driveway is this gigantic, probably 10,000 square foot mansion. Yeah, and Laszlo is sleeping on the floor. He's sleeping on a little mattress on the floor, but still, there's no bed frame, there's no nothing. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a very different living situation over there. And going from there, this class division also plays a part in the concept of this building, I would say. We get to see where Laszlo is coming from in the city, and it's not really doing too well there. There are a lot of people online for the food bank. It's crazy to think just on top of all of this, that this rich man wants to build this towering achievement, but there's so many people in need just right down the hill. And I think that dovetails nicely into another facet of the class theme, which is this intersection of art and commerce. In the film, there's a constant push and pull between his artistic endeavor and the costs and compromises that have to be taken for it to be realized. It's an easy metaphor to say that it's actually representative of the film process, as the grand ambitions of a script have to be sculpted according to budgetary restraints, studio and intervention in order to distribute. We heard something recently about how the original cut of uh, Luca Guadagnino's Queer was like three and a half hours, and now it's two hours and 20 minutes, and that was something that had to attract distributors. So anyway, we see Laszlo asked to compromise on building materials, heights of ceilings. We talked about the place of worship earlier. In the second half of the film, we see his character completely consumed by these changes desperately clinging to his vision, even if it costs him some relationships. I won't say how, but at that time, it's really easy to see him as a raging egotist. Mm. But I think the epilogue of the film has a way of reframing the way that he was acting and giving it some additional layers that are really interesting. So I just wanted to put that out there too. I keep coming back to this theme of brutalism because we've already talked about the architecture itself. We talked about the class division is an example of this maximalism versus minimalism. Gone briefly into the score, I think there's these mm -hmm. very simplistic light and piano expressions that yeah. are happening during certain scenes. And then in other scenes, there's these horns that are being played so jarringly and loud. It has quieter sections. It has 
more discordant, almost atonal sections that are discomforting, particularly in the back half of the film. It has a tremendous sense of building tension. We were talking about in the opening scene how it's mostly percussion, but the final sequences have it too. It, it has this tremendous ability to be both minimalist and maximalist as we were talking about. I would be shocked if this wasn't nominated for score at the Oscars. The movie comes out in December and I'm like really annoyed that I can't listen to it on Spotify right now <laughs> because I can't remember what the main theme sounded like, but I knew that I loved it. The theme of brutalism or the idea of brutalism permeates every aspect of this film in a really interesting, intelligent way. I think from here, I'd like to get into a little bit more deeper aspects of the film and what happens later on in the movie. Yep. So if you haven't seen The Brutalist, Come back to this review once you've seen it. Otherwise, we're going to be talking a lot of spoilers, the ending and specific scenes in general. And also, I want to get a little deeper into specific characters as well. I want to get into this story of how this is. You're stealing my water. Thank you for this. I need some water. Sorry, what? Spoilers? Guy Pierce is a rapist. What are you talking about? Okay, we didn't need to go that fast into it. But <laughs> I basically want to start from the process of this building being made. Okay. Because there's a lot happening in here that as the film progresses we actually see this initial oppression or this facade about his character slipping away where we first saw a man that seemingly commit to his mistakes and you know seemingly cares for others by wanting to build this community center. We are left seeing this man for who he truly is. He's insecure, he's uninspired, and he's really just plain mediocre. He's someone who you uh, come to find out really needs to rely on the talents of others because he doesn't really have any talents of his own besides yeah. being wealthy, which is a, not a talent. Yeah. <laughs> and it becomes even more clear during the process of building this huge complex that he's someone that absolutely needs. It's like a necessity for him to stamp his name on this creation mm -hmm. just to feel important, even though the only effort he put into it was his generational wealth. Eventually, he becomes this man who just can't escape who he is deep down inside. And in the end, he entirely disappears. Mm -hmm. And that's something we definitely have to discuss. But I do want to go back to this scene of being in Italy because they're going to look for this stone that they could use as building materials. Yeah, which is up until that moment, an absolutely beautiful and stunning scene. Them walking through this almost natural marble maze, picking out the marble for um, for the building. Some of the most extraordinary visuals I've seen in the past couple of years. But there's a particular moment in the scene that is very important because he is walking up to a piece of marble and the foreman, the guy that works there, mm -hmm. he's talking about the stone and how if you listen close, you can hear the heartbeat as if there's a life in it. I mm -hmm. think he's referring specifically, I can't remember, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but he's referring to men who died specifically in it or something like that? I can't remember. Okay. This is the crummy thing about going to film festivals is we only get to watch the movie once before we review it and usually it's crammed between two <laughs> other movies that we just saw. So you, uh, our details aren't perfect. Okay. For yeah. me, this moment is extremely important. So if I'm getting it wrong, I apologize. But a guy was making mention of people uh, burying themselves underneath the stone to be part of the stone or something like that. And mm -hmm. that's why you could hear their heartbeat. So it has something to do with that. Harrison Lee Van Buren is very taken in this moment. And he, you could see him. He puts his head up to the stone. And he listens to it. And he's mm -hmm pretty much smitten right there in the moment. But from there, we end up going to this little party and it's at this party that Lazo gets drunk and Harrison Lee Van Buren takes advantage of him and sexually assaults him. I actually was wondering throughout the film why he was single. I was very curious about his, if he was asexual or, or what it was because yeah. the film never really goes into it until we find out what he did to Laszlo. There's a lot of things that you could think about that. I think one of the things is he could be a closeted homosexual, but if he is a closeted homosexual, he's also a person that needs to take sex by power. Yeah, he, it has to he, do with power dynamics. Yeah. yeah, I think he he needs to see somebody who is down on their luck and he needs to take advantage of that. That's yeah. just what his personality is. And when we get back to the mansion, we have Felicity Jones' character and she finds out that this had happened and that's when her amazing scene that you talked about earlier happens and she walks into that mansion, she addresses him and calls him out. Yeah, in front of everybody. And I think it's one shot. It's very rare for me in filmmaking. And this is actually one of those moments where it happened where I'm not paying attention to the filmmaking prowess and what the film is doing. And I'm actually completely engulfed and enthralled with what was happening. And that was one of those moments in this film. So the whole scene progresses. And then the end of it, I said, wait, was that all one shot? And that made me realize how good it was because I couldn't even think about, you know, the, the filmmaking mechanics of it. It was all about the emotion of the scene. And Felicity Jones delivery of her lines and the ferocity of which she confronts him is 
just fantastic. When you talk about an Oscar scene, that's the epitome of an Oscar scene. That's exactly what they play and they submit would be that scene. Yeah. If it is one shot, it follows her into the dining room. She talks to them. She does this admission. I think the camera does some other stuff because we see other people yeah. talking to her. And then she is incapacitated and dragged to the end of the hall and accosted and the daughter ends up apologizing to her and sending her on her way. And then Van Buren's son runs upstairs. The camera follows him while he looks for his father. So yeah. it's a very long sequence. And I was really, really impressed with the filmmaking, thinking back on it. It's a fantastic scene. And this is when Guy Pierce's character disappears. Yes. Everybody goes I've searching. Been waiting for this because <laughs> I said to you, I think we were like, I don't know, we're drinking coffee in the morning or something. And I said, we don't ever really find out what happens to Guy Pierce's character, yeah. do we? You said there's a visual cue yeah. that's given that I miss. So what yeah. was this visual cue? When he disappears, the camera is following all these people searching for him. And it ends up in this massive complex that has been built. And more specifically, this stone altar that's mm -hmm. made of the same marble from the Italian mm -hmm. village. I think he has a necessity to live with this creation because he has to claim it as his own. Mm -hmm. It's so important for him to be remembered that I think he just put himself under that stone somehow and he laid himself to rest there. I forget exactly how it works, but Laszlo explains it at some point that the way that the sun comes in, it projects the cross down. Yeah. Right? We see that with the moonlight towards the end of the film and it, and it projects down onto the marble. It's such a striking visual image that I know that Brady Corbet had something in mind with that, even if it's something that's meant to be interpreted in a variety of ways. Yeah. Anyway, I do think that you're onto something. I would love to see the film again and have an interpretation. It's a long enough sequence that I think that there have to be clues in there that give us some sort of thematic payoff. Yeah. I'm just not totally sure what that is at this point. But I do like that the film ends that way, that it doesn't really give us an answer, but at the same time, it doesn't really matter. Like, why do we need to follow this man anymore? And it's almost an attention thing. The film stopped giving him attention. And for once, a, a man that's so boastful is actually hiding. So one final thing I want to talk about is the scene that follows the scene. You're talking years, about the epilogue? Yeah, yep. it's the epilogue. And it's years later. It's this event to celebrate Laszlo's life and his achievements. And at the beginning of this event, there is an address by Laszlo's niece, who also plays a role in the film throughout it. What's so striking and interesting about this is she doesn't really talk at all during the entirety of the film. She doesn't yep. say much of anything at all. At the very beginning of the film, there's a scene with her sitting down in a chair. It's the first shot. Yeah. yeah, it's the first shot. She's being asked questions. We never get to see a response. She is completely silent through the whole thing. So now we get to see her speak. And obviously this is very purposely done because it's in what she has to say that's so important. In a sense, a discussion about how his life is about the destination rather than the journey. Yeah. Turns over that, you know, old saying that it's not about where you're going. It's about how you get there. Yeah. She does a very good job of explaining all of the nuances and details from Lazlo's life that made its way into his work. And I think she sees the work as the destination and the journey to get there is all of those details. So I did like that as well. So are you ready to go to grades? I am. I'm going to give the film an A, which I think is the first A I've given out this year. I don't think this is my favorite film of the year. I mean, it's up there for sure, but I just can't think of many ways that it could have been better done objectively if there is objectivism in film criticism one thing that i do want to say and i'm not even sure this is a real criticism but you can feel the film striving to be great like it's maximalist in all of these senses it really reminds me of early paul thomas anderson i'm not the first person to say that but say boogie nights and magnolia era paul thomas anderson so as much as those films and this film certainly is absolutely oozing with artistic merit and artful creation, there's a lack of restraint, like a cinematic showboating that if I watch the film too many times, it may wear on me. Ultimately, and again, this is a personal thing and feel free to yell at me in the comments, but I love when a filmmaker has the confidence to leave it up to the audience. And I think using the PTA example, he eventually got that with films like The Master and Phantom Thread a little later in his career. He tamed his massive ambitions to a more enigmatic portrait. So I completely understand why this film didn't go in that direction, but I do hope that Corbet continues to grow and the way that he's absolutely bursting onto the scene with this fierce talent right now, I hope that he tames that bluster a little bit in future films. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's a film that's very showboaty, but what it's doing is still extremely impressive. Like there's a reason that people have said that this is There Will Be Blood with Architects. That's very high praise. So the thing that I want to end on is I think you and I are fairly engaged film watchers and feeling truly immersed in a film is a very rare thing, at least for me. I'm more of a logical film watcher than an emotional one. I'm always tracing what the camera is doing, what the editing is doing, what are the nuances of the performance, what is the score doing. This film has all of that in spades. Like you could cognitively deconstruct everything that's going on on the screen. It's 
it's all super interesting, but I truly felt immersed for three and a half hours. It was to the point where I asked you, oh wait, is that one shot or did they cut the whole time? <laughs> I was so dialed into the film's tone and execution that I had that very rare experience that the mechanics of filmmaking fell into the background and I was just truly one with the film. That is worthy of an A more than anything else. I completely agree. I give the movie an A as well. I also want to echo what you had just said is that it's not your favorite film of the year, but constructively speaking, it is probably one of the best films we've seen so far. It's, oh, I definitely. Think, I don't know yeah. if I gave it any either this year. So there's a reason that everybody claps so hard right after the prologue. Yeah. And it's because this film starts out so seriously, but I wouldn't say in serious in tone, but in seriousness in execution from a filmmaking standpoint. You realize at that moment that you're about to go on some kind of journey that's exciting, that has a lot of moving pieces. And you, you just realize that this film is striving and has ambitions far beyond a lot of other films that are out there right now. So I think for that reason alone, that's why everybody was just clapping. I think everybody was just super excited in that moment. But going from there, I just want to reiterate what I said before. I love how this concept of brutalism permeates so many aspects of the film. It was just so well thought out how all the characters were going to be in certain moments, whether they were going to be loud or soft. Certain camera angles would focus on the architecture from these imposing angles it would be looking from down looking straight up to the sky and you would see how massive and tall the building was i just loved how this film employed all these different filming techniques and narrative techniques and character techniques to really lean into this i guess you would say ethos yeah i mean that's why it's such a personal film but also an american epic it's able to do both of those things at the same time all right so that's it for our review of the brutalist the brutalist will be in theaters on december 20th let us know in the comments what did you think about the brutalist as always Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time. It's a brutal review.